Hey guys, in this video we're going to take a look at chapter 26 of the Ecke textbook titled A Grim Lesson. Now, this chapter doesn't have a ton of grammar in it, but the grammar it does have is really important. We're going to be coming back to pronouns and learning about something called demonstrative pronouns. To start, let's take a look at the derivatives. So, the first word we want to look at is kustos, which means guard in Latin. And in English, we get a couple of good derivatives from this, words like custody, custodian. It's actually related to the verb we've already seen before, custodire, which means to guard. This is just the noun form of it. The next word is nonumquam. Now, for this, we want to break it apart into its two different pieces. So you have known, which we know means not, and numquam, which we've learned means never. When you put them together, you get the English translation for this word, which is sometimes. And it makes sense because literally it means not never, which we would translate it as sometimes. The next word we want to look at is yakere. Now, from this verb in English, we get the derivative adjacent, which makes sense. This word in Latin is a verb that means to lie or to lie down. So if you're adjacent to something, you can think of it as kind of lying next to something. The real reason I brought this up, though, is I don't want you to confuse this with another verb we've seen, which is yakio yakere, which means to throw. Now, if you look at the way they're both spelled, the spelling is similar in terms of the letters. The key difference here is that in the infinitive, to lie down has a long e, so it's yakere. To throw is a short e, third conjugation, yakere. Just don't confuse the two. There's a slight difference in the first principal part, but they're close enough that you might get confused, and they mean two completely different things. The next word we want to look at is waitare. Now, in English, the word we get is veto, which makes sense because this verb in Latin means to forbid. So when you veto something, you're kind of overruling it or forbidding it. Next, we have no care. In English, we get a few derivatives from this. Words like innocent, innocuous, nuisance, obnoxious. And they make sense because this verb on its own means to do harm or to harm someone. And you can see that we put plus D-A-T here in the vocab list. It means it's going with a dative. So you're going to be saying to do harm to someone when we translate this in the book. This is actually related to neko nekare, which means to kill. So you can see you have to do harm and to kill. They're related to each other. The next word we have is metus, which means fear. Now, pay attention to the genitive here. The long U.S., as we learned in our last video, is telling us that this is a fourth declension noun. This is where we get the word meticulous from. And again, the word metus means fear. So if you're really meticulous about something, it almost means like you're afraid that something might go wrong. You're really, really careful. That's a derivative from this word. The next word we have is servo servare. Now this means to save in Latin, and the English derivatives that come from it are basically retaining the same meaning. Words like preserve, reserve, they have to do with saving something. So if you're preserving something, you're saving it. If you're reserving it, you're kind of saving it for later. They're all holding on to the same meaning of to save. The next word we have is gladius. Now this word in Latin means sword. And the English derivative we get from it is gladiator, which makes sense. If you think about it, a gladiator is a fighter. You know, think of the Colosseum, the arena, and the weapon they're carrying is the gladius, which is the small short sword that the Roman legions would carry. So these two words are connected. A gladiator is just someone who's carrying the gladius, which is a sword. The next word we have is oculus, which means eye. Now, in English, we get words that all have to do with eyes. Ocular, oculist, binoculars, monocle, they all have to do with your eyes, which makes sense. This brings us to the grammar for this chapter. Now, I told you at the beginning of the video we're going to be coming back to pronouns, and we are. We're going to be looking at something called demonstrative adjectives and pronouns. And specifically, we're talking about the words hic and ile. So to start, we want to think, what is a demonstrative? So, in English and in Latin, we have to make a distinction between something that's close to us and something that's farther away from us. And again, it's in relation to the speaker, which is most often yourself. So, if we think of two puppies, right? We have one puppy in the foreground, one in the background. They're both technically puppies, right? So, we could use the word puppy for both of them. But that doesn't really distinguish between the two of them. Which puppy are we talking about? So, in English, the puppy that's closer to us, we would say this puppy. But for the puppy that's far away, we wouldn't say this puppy, we would say that puppy. These are the demonstrative pronouns. So we call the words this and that demonstratives. And again, it comes from the Latin verb demonstrare, which means to show or to point out. They're literally pointing words that point to specific persons or things. In English, 
we refer to persons or things that are relatively close to us with the demonstrative this. And the same goes for something that's far away. We use the word that. Think about the puppy example. If you call both puppies this puppy, it's kind of confusing. One is closer and one is farther away. So the basic distinction is this is to refer to things that are close to you. That refer to persons or things that are farther away. In Latin, we use the demonstrative pronouns hic, hike, hoc, which means this, and ille, illa, illud, which means that. So if we come back to our puppy example, we would say hic canis, this dog, and ille canis, that dog. The hic and ille are the demonstratives. They're pointing to the different dogs and telling you which one is closer and which one is further away. Now this is the entire chart for the demonstrative endings. It looks very overwhelming, but if you break it down, you can see there's actually some patterns here that will help you memorize it. So the first thing you want to notice is that for hic and ille, the genitive and dative singular are the exact same word. So you have huius for the genitive singular and huic for the dative singular. On the other side for ille, you have ilius for the genitive singular and illi for the dative singular. So that makes it a little bit easier to memorize. On the plural end of the chart, you can see the dative and ablative plurals are the exact same word. So you have hes across the board for dative and ablative plural, and then you have illis, and that also goes across all the genders for dative and ablative plural. So again, these little patterns make it a little bit easier to memorize. In addition, take a look at the ablative singular. Now, the only part that's changing in these words is the vowel. And if you look for the masculine and neuter side, you'll see they're using the long o. This makes sense. We've actually seen a long O used with ablative endings when we're talking about different nouns. So this shouldn't look that different. And again, the feminine is using the long A. The same goes for ille, illa, illud. So in the masculine and neuter side, we have illo with the long O, just like you'd expect. And in the middle, you have illa, which is the feminine ablative singular. Again, it's using the long A. This is something we've seen for ablatives for first and second declension nouns. Now, the plurals are actually the easiest ones to memorize. And if you look, I've highlighted all the endings for both the words this and that. And if you look, the endings are the first and second declension noun endings. So, for instance, if you take hic and go on the masculine column, down the plural you have e orum is os is as the endings. For the feminine, it's i orum is os is. And for the neuter, we have blank, orum, is, blank, is. And in this case, the neuter is using a, spe a specific word, hike, which we're going to fill in for nominative and accusative. But for the majority of them, all you're doing is taking the first and second declension noun endings and putting the letter H in front of it. And the same goes on the right-hand side of this column for ille, illa, illud. For masculine, you have e, orum, is, os, is. For feminine, i, orum, is, os, is. And for neuter, a, orum, is, a, is. If you put ILL -L in front of them, you have the right spelling. So when you memorize this chart, don't get bogged down with the exact spelling for everything. Just memorize the endings and then put either an H or an ILL -L in front of it. You'll come up with the right way to spell it. Now even for the neuter, I mentioned they're using something different. You want to remember that for neuter nouns, or neuter endings in this case, it's always going to match up where the nominative and accusative are the exact same thing. So for hic, hike, hoke, for the nominative singular we have hawk, H-O-C, and then for the accusative singular you have hawk, H-O-C, the exact same word. The same goes for the plural, and on the other side for ille, illa, illud, you're going to see the word illud is nominative singular and accusative singular, and then illa is going to be nominative plural and accusative plural. And on this side, for the word that, ille, illa, illud, it makes sense that the plural form of the neuter is an A. We've seen that before with second declension nouns, so that kind of follows the same pattern we've known for a while. So often demonstratives are used as adjectives, and they describe nouns, which makes sense. So for instance, if you think to our example, we had hic canis, which means this dog. As adjectives, they have to match the case, number, and gender of the noun they modify, which is something we've learned in earlier chapters in the book. So let's take a look at an example sentence. If you were looking at this sentence in Latin, you would translate it, that courier fiercely urged on the horses. The demonstrative in this case is ille, which we're translating as that. The noun it's going with is tabularius. Now, the word tabularius is masculine, nominative, singular. This is why we use the demonstrative ille, which is also masculine, nominative, singular. So again, the case number and gender match up, 
which we've learned for all noun adjective agreement, it, it's really not that difficult of an idea. You just have to know the endings for ele, ela, ilud. So by nature, demonstratives are emphatic, meaning that the speaker is trying to really build some emphasis into a sentence. So for instance, it's not just any man, you're saying this man, you're really emphasizing the word this. You can almost imagine that the demonstratives are being underlined, right? That's one way that I like to tell my students to think about it. They're really meant to make a point. So when you see a demonstrative, think of emphasis being added to the sentence. When a demonstrative appears without a noun, it functions as a pronoun. So in this case, we use the gender to determine the meaning of the pronoun. So for instance, if you saw hick by itself, since it's masculine, you're saying this man, even if the word man is not in your sentence. The same goes for feminine. Honk would be this woman, hike these things. So whatever the gender is of the demonstrative, when it's acting as a pronoun, that's how we translate it into English. If it's masculine, you would supply the word man. If it's feminine, woman. If it's neuter, thing. The same goes for ele, ela, ilud. It just depends on the gender. So again, if you see masculine instead of this man, now you have that man. Ela would mean that woman. Ela would mean these things if it was neuter plural. So let's take another look at a sentence. If we have ille postquam haec audiwit, e caupona se praecipitavit, we would translate it, he, after he heard these things, rushed out of the inn. So the demonstrative here is ille, and you'll notice there's no noun going with it, so it's acting as a pronoun here. Since ille is masculine, we translate it he. The second demonstrative we have here is haec. And if you pay attention, there's no noun going with hike either. In this case, hike is going to be neuter plural, so we translate it these things. So just a helpful hint, whenever you're translating these, make sure you pay close attention to the long marks. This will help you distinguish between hick, which means this, and heek, which is an adverb that means here. We've seen the adverb earlier on in the book. You just don't want to confuse the two. When you're talking about demonstrative pronouns, there's no long mark over that I. So let's do a quick recap. Demonstrative adjectives and pronouns are used to point out certain nouns as being either close or far from the speaker. When something's close that you want to point out, we use hic, hike, ho, and we translate it as this and these, depending on whether it's singular or plural. When you want to point to something farther away, we use ille, illa, illud, and we translate it as that when it's something that's singular, and those when you're pointing to plural, you know, more than one object or person. As adjectives, you want to remember that demonstratives need to follow the rules we learned for noun adjective agreement, meaning they have to match the case, number, and gender of the noun they're going with. The key to all this is memorization. So think back earlier in the video when I showed you the chart of all the demonstrative endings. You want to break it down into its pieces and pick up the pattern. In certain cases, the endings are going to be very familiar to you, particularly in the plural form. So use that to help you memorize the chart. That way you'll always know what you're looking at when you're dealing with demonstratives.